To get the session started, I would like to introduce uh, Kamakshi Rao. Uh, Kamakshi is a partner at The Nudge, uh, where she mentors uh, nonprofit startups. Uh, Kamakshi has two decades of investment experience. She was at Capital International, where she invested in listed equities in Asia and has served on the board of Larson & Trubro Financial Holdings. Uh, since 2013, uh, Kamakshi has been affiliated with Ankur Capital, a venture capital fund that invests in companies for low-income Indians. Kamakshi is an alumna of Harvard and UPenn. Uh, thank you for joining us, Kamakshi. Over to you. Thank you, Rima, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. It's my honor to welcome Professor Arvind Panagriya to the plenary session of the Nudge Forum. Professor Panagriya is Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. He was the first Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog and was India's G20 Sherpa from 2015 to 17. He has worked with the ADB, the World Bank, the IMF, and the UNCTAD in various capacities and has authored more than 15 books, including with Jagdish Bhagwati, India, the Emerging Giant, Why Growth Matters. His latest book, India Unlimited, Reclaiming the Lost Glory, is to be released shortly. He writes a monthly column in the Times of India, and his guest columns have appeared in the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and India Today. In March 2012, the Government of India honored Professor Panagriya with the Padma Bhushan. Welcome, Professor Panagriya. This session will follow the format of a conversation between us with the opportunity for the audience to also ask questions as Rima has just explained. As you know, the forum has participation from government, industry, and civil society. And in the course of our conversation, I will do my best to reflect all three perspectives and also to incorporate audience questions as they come in. So thank you for joining us and I look forward to our conversation. At India's independence, Jawaharlal Nehru, speaking about India's tryst with destiny, said the ambition of the greatest man of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. He had written extensively about the history and success of different approaches to poverty reduction in India. Could you share your perspective to start our conversation? Great. Uh, thanks for having me, Kamakshi. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so yeah, you provide a good starting point. Um, uh, 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 as you know, as, as you just mentioned, the, the um, uh, India's Stress with Destiny speech by Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, he started off, you know, uh, uh, outlining uh, uh, 73 years ago uh, what precisely uh, uh, so you know the the uh, uh, speech just to quote a little bit from it uh, to, to get us started uh, uh, he said you know that the service of India means the service of the millions who suffer it means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. The ambition of the greatest man of our generation, uh, that was a reference to Mahatma Gandhi, has been to wipe every tear from every eye that may be beyond us, but as long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. So, you know, from the very beginning, it was very clear, uh, Prime Minister Nehru was very clear and that has, uh, carried on subsequently with the uh, following leadership, uh, those who succeeded Prime Minister Nehru, that India's biggest challenge was to uh, uh, deal with its abject poverty, uh, widespread poverty. Uh, so the objective was correct. Uh, initially, in fact, if one goes back into the history of discussions that took place in the Congress party, even before independence, uh, uh, th th there was a, a planning committee uh, in the Congress party back in 1938. There also, they talked about this and they said, look, you know, we are extremely poor. The country's overall income is so low that the only way to deal with poverty is faster growth. Uh, and they felt at that time that, look, you know, we need an increase in income of about sixfold, uh, but that is difficult to achieve in a short period of time. And so they set a target of, you know, something like 300% uh, rise in uh, the incomes. 
uh, they thought that that will be a good start. So it was the the, the objective was right. Uh, the removal of poverty, the instrument that they identified was right, uh, which was growth. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the the uh, the approach that we adopted. Now Nehru was unfortunately also very influenced by the Soviet model of development. Uh, and so we really ended up uh, uh, adopting this very command and control model, uh, which in the end failed to deliver. Uh, it, it really, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, growth that was seen as the instrument uh, simply did not happen. So if you take, you know, even the first uh, entire 30 year period from 1950 to 1980, in the first three decades, our per capita incomes grew at a measly kind of 1.6% a year. Uh, it's a very slow increase. I mean, if you look at per capita income, if it was 100 uh, rupees, let's say per week in, 19, in, in 1950, it came to only 1980 when we, uh, it came to only 155 or something, we came to 1980. So that's an addition of 50 rupees uh, to a, a originally very low income, you know, so uh, uh, to, uh, of 100, say, per capita, per, per person per uh, week. Uh, it's, it's just too slow. So you see hardly any reduction in poverty. Uh, uh, finally, I think in 1991, there was the big kind of break. Uh, finally, uh, the, the thinking changed. Uh, we uh, uh, gradually decided to move away from the command and control model. Uh, uh, allowed the markets to come in and did the licensing. I, I ended the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, huge restrictions that existed in, uh, on investment, huge restrictions that existed on imports, trade, everything. You know, so a lot of the liberalization happened uh, during the 1990s and early 2000s, and that of course uh, made a big, huge difference. Uh, just again to to give you an idea how how much difference it made. If you take the first 50 years uh, from 1950 to, to, to 2000, uh, you add it from 100, let's say, you know, if I normalize the income per capita income to 100 in 1950, uh, you added just another 200 by the time you came to 2000. Between 2000 and 2014, you had already added more than 300 rupees to that per capita income. So big difference, and, and this is all, you know, uh, after liberalization, and you see during this period, of course, poverty crashing down, uh, and and so poverty, uh, at least abject poverty, as we call it, extreme poverty, that fell quite dramatically uh, during this period, uh, and uh, you see it happening across the board. You know, sometimes we we, we become uh, a suspicion that oh, you know, maybe the the the, the poverty among uh, certain groups has come down, but you know the disadvantaged groups like the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, they did, they did not benefit from the decline in poverty. Not true, actually, across the board, you know, you can look at individually the poverty levels uh, among the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, Muslims, Hindus, Jain, Sikhs, any way you divide groups uh, in the individual states, states, uh, every single state, you know, you take 93, 94 to 2011, 12, and you see poverty significantly coming down. So finally, you know, we, we have done well. It's still extreme poverty. Uh, we are not a prosperous nation. Uh, other countries which started much sooner than we did uh, on the right path to development like South Korea, Taiwan, um, uh, later China even started in nine, about late 1970s. They are far, far ahead of us, uh, 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 but, but we are on the road uh, to, to uh, uh, prosperity. And then if we really do the right things, I think we can get there in another two to three decades. You know, we, we uh, should be about three, a $10 trillion economy or more. Uh, and, and that should really get most of the population prosperous. Thank you. Uh, you know, on the point uh, about getting to a $10 trillion economy uh, over the next few decades, could you uh, specify what uh, specific policies India needs to uh, adopt to accelerate growth so that everyone can become prosperous and also so that India in the process of achieving this prosperity uh, also reaches the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Good, Kamakshi, good. That's a good natural uh, uh, question um, to address. Uh, now, uh, very quickly, of course, you know, the, the reason growth is so important is that it works in two ways. Uh, first, 
uh, it empowers people. You know, so whenever this kind of rapid growth happens, your real wages rise. Uh, and so it puts income in the hands of the people. So uh, their ability also to access the social services gets better. Uh, you know, if you are dirt poor, then you can't take a bus to the school next door or to the hospital next door and so forth. Uh, 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 so even to access social services, you need some minimum income. So that's one way, you know, so the individuals get empowered and, and they can choose to send their children to better schools and so forth. But also growth gives the government much greater power, more revenues come in the hands of the government. And that allows the government to then spend on social causes, uh, on social objectives, uh, education and health being the primary ones. But remember, you know, things like uh, Narega, uh, uh, the Food Security uh, Act and so forth, they simply could not have been implemented on the scale that they are being implemented without the growth that happened uh, after the reforms uh, took root in India. So, so that is the background why growth is really so important. Um, uh, and, and now to get to what we need to do, a uh, lot of things we have already done. I think we have done quite a bit, uh, but I think we do need to do a bit more. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, first and foremost, I think, you know, in our case also, growth is tied to the, this overall question of transformation uh, and good jobs. So today, for example, you know, uh, jobs by themselves is not a major problem for India, I mean, even if you take this pessimistic figure that floated everywhere uh, 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 one, one to two years ago, 6% unemployment rate. As unemployment rates go, that's not such a high rate. And people are doing something. And, and you can see why, because, you know, poverty is, uh, is still, the income levels are so low that uh, to make their ends meet, everybody has to do something. Our real problem is the low productivity. Uh, that the output per worker that we generate is extremely low. Uh, and so the employment also, uh, therefore, uh, produces relatively low levels of output, low levels of value added. And uh, those who are employed by others uh, as, as workers, uh, the wages that they receive are also low. And that really is the crux of the problem that, you know, how do we get out of this low productivity uh, uh, equilibrium. And, and there, at least my own diagnosis, and, and, and I talk at length about this in, in my latest book, The India Unlimited, which uh, in the US will be coming under the, new, under the title New India from Oxford University Press. Uh, what I argue there is that, look, you know, a key problem India, in one of the, a really central problem of India is uh, the, 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 the uh, widespread uh, 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 pr production activity taking place in really tiny units, very, very small units. Now, what does that mean? Take farming, for example. 70 million of Indian farms, and so that's really 70 million out of almost 250 to 300 million families, are working on farms that are less than half hectare with average size of just 0.23, not even a quarter hectare. So you can't produce very much on such a small farm. You're, it is a low productivity activity. Uh, and, and so the workers therefore are employed, but they're underemployed. They're grossly underemployed. Come to industry and services, they are also again, overwhelmingly people are, people are employed in these micro and small enterprises. Now we, you know, often kind of uh, play up, we celebrate uh, micro and small enterprises, but the productivity in these enterprises are, is extremely low. And this is particularly so when it turns out that you have very few medium and large firms. Now, you know, we have a few medium and large firms. These are largely concentrated in industries that are highly capital intensive, right? So you've got automobile, you've got machinery, You've got even pharmaceuticals, information technology. Uh, these are industries uh, where the large firms and medium-sized firms exist, but these are not big employers. Uh, you know, these are capital-intensive or skilled labor-intensive industries. Big employers are apparel, footwear, uh, furniture kind of industries, a lot of light manufacturers, a uh, lot of low-level services and activities, uh, which you can think of, you know, we all see workers, you know, people in our everyday lives working. 
and and these are all very tiny small little enterprises uh, you know there is a concept in india we use we call own account enterprises own account enterprises are the enterprises which do not employ a single hired worker they are all self employed now these own account enterprises account for a very vast part of our employment you know so they are self employed uh, 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 or there are these unincorporated enterprises which are, uh, uh, which are which do employ a few workers but they are very small so all in all when you put together the picture uh, 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 what turns out is that only about 9 to 10% of our workforce works in firms that have even 20 workers or more so you know even if you think of larger enterprises 20 or more it's it's just uh, 10% of the workforce total workforce that is where the problem is so that's where what we need to address we need a much more open economy uh, in that particular respect we have gone back uh, we start we had opened up the economy and this liberalization process gone went very well till 2007 then we stopped and in the last 3 years we have gone into reverse we have started again this whole idea of import substitution has been revived i think that's dangerous that certainly is something we need to uh, return away from then a lot of reforms have been done this government really you know corporate profit tax knocking it down is very very important reform uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, the 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 bankruptcy code uh, the insolvency in bankruptcy code extremely important reform got done dbt very important reform got done but still two very very three very very big areas of reform almost untouched uh you got labor markets very inflexible uh, uh once you hire a worker on a permanent basis extremely difficult to uh, and and you know if you are a larger company then almost impossible to lay off the workers uh, uh that, that is a problem and so you see very small enterprise you know in apparel for example that's a prime example which could provide lots and lots of very good jobs it is doing it has done it for china it, it is doing it for vietnam doing it for bangladesh and not for us uh you know it's an 800 billion dollar market export market in apparel we are got 20 billion less than 20 billion we ought to be exporting about 200 to 300 billion dollars worth of apparel but because our companies tend to be small because the very tough labor laws uh, the firms are uh, not willing to get larger but also land has become a big constraint this land acquisition act that the upa government brought in 2013 very pernicious Uh, it makes it very difficult large enterprises require large pieces of land in india first of all the land uh, titles are not there and so so many pieces of land are always in dispute so you know anybody who is trying to create a 50 acre 100 acre piece of land it's very difficult you know you uh, there's always small little pieces in between uh, which nobody knows from whom to buy so that makes it problematic and the government acquisition is becomes very impossible because the government the, the land acquisition act that we put in place in 2013 is very problematic uh, so you need those then our financial sector currently is in deep stress uh, that will require some work you know because of covid now we we, we uh, uh, that that sector is going to face yet more problem once we begin to come out of covid because there will be possibly other bankruptcies because you know a lot of firms out there uh, uh, which uh, have had a cash flow problem uh, and for wrong reasons they may have to uh, 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 become insolvent and that would of course uh, mean more non performing assets uh, and and there are clearly predictions that you know the as we get out of the crisis and we come to take stock of what happens uh, the the uh, in the public sector banks particularly these non non performing assets may rise up to again 15 percent of their total uh, outstanding loans so that's a very large number so that's something government will need to address at the time but those are the sort of things we need to do urbanization another very important one we are urbanizing very slowly you know we are urbanizing at something like 2 percentage points for a decade you know countries do it per year and we had you know 2 percentage points per decade and we are still 30 31% from 2011 census is a still very low rate of urbanization uh, we need uh, in the cities uh, low rent uh, 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 low rent rental housing you know affordable rental housing very very important 
that all ties back into urbanization uh, issue you know that land prices are so high in india that commercial rental activity is almost impossible it's unprofitable so we need to do things there are a large number of things to do on land uh, uh, how to bring the land prices down but that's uh, another thing we need to do so though, that's a set of things you know i talk about it in the book uh, india unlimited uh, in the set of governance reforms but but uh, uh, they had to go in parallel thank you so we have quite a few questions from the audience and i'm going to take a couple of questions to follow on one of the themes that you have just said so in this process of uh, uh, you know, improving the productivity so that it doesn't happen in uh, these distributed small and micro enterprises, but happens in a way to allow more value add. Uh, there are two questions related to that. Uh, one is when we are from the audience, when we are a ten trillion dollar economy, what do you see as the share of agriculture, manufacturing, and services? And the uh, second, you know, which relates to the point you made about uh, the need for larger scale industrial activity. And the second point related to this, when you actually, I will take this first and I will take the second question later. Okay, very quickly. So on, on it, because this is a very, very good question. Uh, this is where the crux part of the crux of the problem is that we still have about 42% of our workforce. This is the latest uh, PLFS, uh, the, the Periodic Labor Force Survey for 1819. Uh, uh, and, and the figure is about 42% of our total workforce is in agriculture. Now, its share in the GDP is only 15%. And when you get to 10 trillion, it's going to fall to 7, 8%. Unless these workers come out. They have a very, very low share in, uh, in the GDP on which they are being paid. So, so what has not kept pace in India is that, you know, almost every country as it grows rapidly because industry and services can grow, eight, you know, industry can, manufacturing can easily grow 15% in, in the countries like China, uh, South Korea, Taiwan has grown 15% for sustained periods of time. Uh, likewise, services then, you know, services quickly follow the industry because, you know, once manufacturing uh, kicks on, gives you income, people spend it. A lot of non-trade services are all non-traded. Most of them are non-traded. So they have to produce domestically. So they also get kicked up. So they also grow 10, 11%. They can. I mean, you know, agriculture, our, if you take out a total history from 1950 onwards, 3.5%. So you can maybe push it to 4%. But the share, you know, the, the, the arithmetic is, is against agriculture in terms of the share in GDP, it's going to fall. Uh, if you grow rapidly, you know, it is going to fall. Uh, well, even if you go slow, grow slowly, it will still fall, but it will take much longer. That's all, you know, because 10 trillion will take you 40 years rather than 20. So, uh, and, and so this is where the crux of the problem is. You need the farmers actually to migrate out to industry and services. That really is what needs to happen. And which is why in the end, good jobs have to be created. You say, why are mig not enough migrants coming out of agriculture today? You know, in the COVID, we saw all these migrants walking back and so forth. And on the television, it, anything looks very large numbers. But compared to the, when you say it in the perspective of the total population, it's, it is not such a large sort of a number. Migrant workers are still very small proportion. You need many, many more workers to migrate out of agriculture. That's how you know, we are going to raise the, uh, I mean, they need to access, even today, you know, in, outside of agriculture, the, the output per worker in industry and services, even with this low productivity, is about three to four times of what it is in agriculture. Because you know, you've got 42% of the workforce, but you've got only 14, 15% of the output share. So, um, you know, given, um, <clears throat> Given the strong presence of civil society organizations on this forum, a number of questions have come in from the audience about this point of migration. Uh, you know, one of the questions is sort of the opposite of what you have suggested, uh, which is, can any actions be taken to create livelihood opportunities in villages, uh, given Uh, so many of the problems that we saw with migration and reverse migration uh, that were you know, visible to people as a result of COVID. Um, 
And while this is an audience question, it taps into a larger question uh, that may be relevant uh, for us, which is, you know, there's a tension between um, treating everyone, especially the vulnerable, in an equitable manner, and at the same time, on, on, you know, on the other side, maximizing economic growth. So uh, how, what would you suggest uh, for balancing these two objectives and what is the role that each of the stakeholders in uh, watching this forum, uh, government, industry, and NGOs and civil society, what is the role that each of these stakeholders can take in balancing these objectives of equitable treatment of the vulnerable while at the same time maximizing growth? Very, very good, uh, Kamakshi. So first of all, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly agriculture will not solve this problem. Because, you know, I mentioned 70 million farms, less than a quarter uh, a hectare. You can double, the, double their income, you can triple their income. It is so low that doubling or tripling doesn't bring you prosperity. So, so you know, this, this whole idea that we think, I mean, you know, that, that, that somehow we can uh, 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 do things which will raise farm incomes. Uh, we should do all the reforms in agriculture, and I'm very pleased the government has done some of the fantastic marketing reforms. I've been advocating those for a long time and, and very, very pleased that the government did that and all. But still, having said this, the basic point remains that uh, the income of the, uh, in, in agriculture on these 70 million farms, which are less than a, a quarter hectare on average, uh, and every one of these farms is less than half hectare, you cannot get the farmers, you know, now come the, become the livelihood issue. So how, what is, how do you create the livelihood? That is what we have been doing for 70 years. That is what we have, you know, I mean, answer people who say that, uh, that, that create livelihood in rural areas for these people, answer why have we not done it in 70, past 70 years? We have been no independence for 73 years. And since 1950, we have been on this development path. I don't see attention, actually attention is coming precisely from stopping uh, the process of transformation from proceeding ahead, from moving forward. Uh, I think if we actually uh, 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 take the necessary measures now, because of all the policies we have pursued, what are your flourishing sectors? All your flourishing sectors are either highly capital intensive or there are skilled labor intensive. You've got IT. We still want more and more. IT, this is fine. I'm sort of, you know, that's all sectors that are doing well, should do well. This is a good thing. But uh, uh, your machinery sector, your uh, 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 financial, uh, 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 financial sector, uh, 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 your uh, pharmaceutical sector, uh, uh, any sector you mentioned which actually has done well. Petroleum refining, another very successful uh, sector, you know. Uh, uh, but all of these sectors are either highly capital intensive or they are skilled labor intensive. They are not creating jobs for the people down there in, in, in farming and, and, and in, in uh, uh, rural areas and so forth. You need industrialization to become broader based. You need the labor intensive industries. Apparel, footwear, uh, uh, furniture, vast number of these light manufacturers that uh, 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 China continues to still actually in spite of its you know, wages that are four times our wages, continues to do uh, all the, uh, the, the daily use uh, 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 items, you know, whether it's kitchenware or, you know, things like umbrella, the, you, the, and everyday things that we, we use. Why are we not exporting these in very large volumes? That is ultimately, if you do that, you grow far more rapidly. Government gets revenues. You caught the revenue, then the government has the revenues to spend on creating livelihood uh, and what have you in the rural areas. But if you don't have this, you don't have the revenues, how many people are paying taxes? A very tiny fraction uh, is, is paying taxes because a tiny fraction, only a tiny fraction have that kind of income. So, I mean, after 50, why do it take 50 years to start Narega? I mean, I'm not a fan of Narega. I would do cash transfers if I, it was up to me because Narega takes away the people's labor and doesn't do enough with it. So productivity of the Narega labor is very low in my view. 
some good use was done by prime minister modi as absolutely no doubt you know they started doing the wells and it for swachh bharat and so forth so i think productivity of this did improve dramatically but i would just give the money to the people and leave the labor with them then they can use their labor to earn some more extra income uh, in other employments uh, so that is what i would do but anyway but because some growth happened finally this is why we were able to do narega this is why we were able to do that do then the 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 uh, 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 the, the uh, food security act this is why we uh, 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 were able to finance the pm kisan now you know 75000 crore rupees gets transferred uh, under pm kisan every year uh, so but this is still small is still is still too low you need more you need more uh and and more is going to come from precisely the kinds of policies that i'm talking about once you get more you can do things in, for the livelihood also but but without it you will not you know i mean if you think this if if you want to balance this tension and and therefore not take uh, do the necessary reforms then we'll continue to grow at 6 7 5 6 7% we'll get there but will take 40 years so thank you thank you so much so on this um topic of you know we need to do more right now in order to get the revenues in order to be able to do more uh for the people you know there's a saying that you shouldn't let any crisis go to waste and with the covid crisis right now there is a lot of talk of uh companies diversifying their supply chains out of china and into other countries what opportunity does this provide to india and what should india do to uh you know uh, uh, uh grab opportunities that on a long term basis that are presented by covid it's a very good question again kamakshi uh and and absolutely i think you know we are in a, we, are, we are very well placed currently uh, you know who who has the kind of labor pool that uh, that china does right i mean if you are leaving china in a natural way which is the country that ought to succeed it should be india uh uh but uh, uh, and and lot of uh, multinationals were already leaving china i mean it, you know the 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 us china kind of trade war plus then covid are uh, uh, adding on to it uh, accelerated that process but the process was already underway all the companies wanting to move out of china because the wages had risen quite dramatically in china and and so many Uh, in many of the labor intensive activities china has become not unprofitable so these activities will, these activities will continue to move out of china but we need to do things uh, domestically i mean you know it it really one of the things that i have argued is to you know create about half dozen what i call these autonomous employment zones uh, this is very much you know reproduce shenzhen shenzhen in china the history is that you know uh, around 1980 this was uh, a, a, a group of fishing villages with about 300000 people uh, as the population uh, then china kind of opened it up to investors from hong kong from taiwan even from south korea anywhere from from wherever they would come in uh, very flexible labor markets very flexible land markets and shenzhen of course has local authority local uh, administration can they can write its own land laws they can write their own labor laws uh, uh, so so a lot of autonomy they got uh, and that in effect you know brought a huge amount of and today the per capita income uh, in shenzhen is something like 25000 plus and the uh, population is about 12 to 13 million uh, 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 it, it, it 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 is an astonishing kind of transformation and and shenzhen is an example but there are other cities on the coast of china which have undergone similar transformation this is the model we ought to copy uh, you know create half dozen or so of these autonomous zones two or three of those ought to be near the coast uh, so that you know they really can also bring uh, goods uh, uh, components and process them quickly and then quickly export them back out a uh, lot of value added domestically in our market uh, employ our workers and you know this is where the multinationals could easily then bring in also could come in also because you know if you give them autonomy uh, institute good labor uh, because nationally i think this is a real challenge for the government to look, to to 
reform the land laws, labor laws, and so forth, but within certain zones. But the zones can't be like these special economic zones we created previously. These are tiny little things, you know, which became land grabs. That's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about take areas of 300 to 500 square kilometers. Uh, some of it is maybe already built up. There may be some activity already going on. That is fine. Just declare it as the autonomous employment zone uh, and then give it lots and lots of authority locally to respond to the needs of the businesses and, and, and let these uh, multinationals come in there, uh, uh, locate there. Uh, they, you know, the big advantage of the multinationals is they bring their own capital, they bring their own management, they bring their own technology. They, above all, most important, they bring the market links. They are operating in the global economy. They know where the world markets are. Uh, they know who are the buyers of their products abroad. They use our workers. And that is where you get to create lots of good jobs uh, uh, for the people. So the whole transformation that I talked about, you know, that's one way to, to kickstart. So, but there's a huge opportunity for us to, to grab. Thank you. You mentioned one of the, you know, some of the what you need to grab this opportunity. Uh, but on the other side, from the employee's perspective, uh, one of the questions that has come in from the audience is, what is your perspective on the future of work? What are the skills the workforce needs to be equipped with, not just to benefit themselves, but also to effectively contribute to economic growth as you see it? Uh, to, and to this audience question, I would add a, a supplement with a question of my own which is uh, for people who don't expect to receive higher education, but to expect to receive uh, only secondary level education, what do you uh, see as necessary in our education system to allow this increase in productivity, allow the people to uh, grab this opportunity as you see these uh, large companies getting built through the policies you've outlined? Yeah. So both, it's the same question, more or less. So look, you know, a couple of very good things in the, in the national education, the new education policy, uh, provided we, you know, properly implement these. And that is always in sort of uh, 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 issue for, in India, but vocational. Now the new education policy says that they're going to incorporate vocational training, uh, vocational education as a part of the regular curriculum. I've been arguing for this for a long time. Taiwan actually followed that model. That's very, very important. We should do it as fast as we can. Uh, I mean, you know, even re people who are not necessarily going to be, be, be doing the, uh, the, the, the services jobs uh, of the kind that vocational training will train you into, would love to get some, you know, I mean, how to do a little plumbing, how to do a little bit of car repair. Even, you know, I would have loved to know that in my college days or school days. So that's one very, very important thing. Uh, uh, we, we need to really do that. And, and my, the, for the rest of it, you know, what skills and so forth. My personal view always has been that, look, you know, you should let the industry do the skilling. When we say that on a massive scale, we are going to skill you and so forth. Some skills you can do, you know, driving, for example, it's a skill commonly required. So, you know, there's a large demand for it and so forth. But beyond that, you cannot skill them in the way that enterprise will want you. And moreover, you don't know which skill will be in demand. I mean, if we really could figure that out, planning commission would have succeeded. But we, we had the planning commission trying to figure these things out for 50 years. Which sectors will do well, which sectors will not do well. And, so, but, and you know, they even tried to decide which sector should do well, not only will, but should do well. But in the end, it was an utter failure. So it is the have good policies. It is the entrepreneurs who will decide what activities they want to undertake. Uh, uh, the only reason I'm mentioning certain types of industries, labor intensive industries, is because that is based on the experience of every country that has succeeded, that initially labor intensive industries have to do well. And if in India, in spite of this massive workforce, labor intensive industry is not doing well, there is something wrong with the policies. So those policies need to be fixed. But often, I tell you, apparel, I've talked to our largest exporter. Uh, this is, uh, 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 
Harish, Mr. Harish Ahuja, who runs the, uh, um, uh, the largest uh, export firm, Shai Exports, uh, from India. And he says, look, you know, give me a person with five, fifth grade, proper fifth grade uh, uh, education. We can, uh, we can skill the person within about six weeks. Uh, and this, within six weeks, the person comes to full productivity. So for most part, allow the enterprises because, you know, then they know exactly what kind of skills, how they should skill and which skills. Uh, some the government can do. But, but by and large, I think, you know, give them basic vocational education uh, through uh, both school as well as college. So even the kids who are doing uh, only up to 10th grade and so forth, uh, while they do this, uh, and this can be done side by side in a regular school so that you don't also stigmatize. I think India has a lot of this stigmatization, stigma in, in, in India about vocational, you know, ITI, you no, know, you know, who normally wants to go to ITI, but put them into regular, even, you know, in the, still, uh, uh, we are living in 21st century and almost two decades have passed and still you see these advertisement uh, coming in, you know, that they, people want BA, Bachelor of Arts, but they don't want somebody having graduated from ITI or something, you know, in, in the marriage market, I'm saying, you know, there's still the prevalent view. And for that stigma continues. Uh, so do it in, in a regular education, give them vocational and so forth. So there'll be no stigma to attach to it either. And they will get their basic skills so that they are ready to then learn what specifically they will need to do in the specific industry in which they eventually get employed. So that's how I would approach it. Thank you. So uh, we now have a problem because we have only five minutes left. And it's clear that we, if we had another 50 minutes left, we still wouldn't get through all of the uh, points that Professor Panagria would like to make. Uh, so uh, what uh, I would suggest is there are um, two or three questions from the audience that I can pose to you. And perhaps you could choose which one you would like to answer, okay. Professor Panagria. Yeah, since there might be time left for only one question. Okay. Um, one question is, how do we ensure food security if we move away from agriculture? Uh, and the other option that uh, you might uh, want to address is, uh, has to do with quality of life. And uh, you know, given uh, that you cannot measure it purely in terms of poverty, uh, what are the other measures and perhaps uh, to make it more precise, I could add, given that we are in COVID times, what changes could you suggest to uh, improve healthcare delivery to uh, the vulnerable in India? So if you would like to address uh, both in two or three minutes or just one, I leave the choice up to you. Okay, I think both can be addressed. Food security is a straightforward matter. Uh, 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 you know, um, uh, Forty percent of the workforce does not have to produce food that that the country needs. America only two, three or four percent, uh, probably maybe even two uh, percent. Uh, uh, but you know, it's certainly below five percent of the workforce that produces food for entire America, and they can export an awful lot uh, uh, as well. Uh, so, so they are also producing quite a bit for the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> food uh, production can easily be maintained, actually. Uh, 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 in fact, marginal decline in workforce has happened in agriculture, uh, but very largely because a lot of the women have withdrawn out of the workforce. Uh, uh, but but output, output has continued to grow. So I'm not worried a bit, actually. That can easily be done. Larger farms will actually also become more capital intensive and, and they will produce. So that's not a big problem. On the quality of life, of course, you know, environment is a big issue. Uh, and, and our cities need to be cleaned up. I mean, you know, uh, if you look at uh, the, the list of uh, most polluted cities, out of the top 10, uh, India is, uh, has about eight of them. Uh, I mean, even a city like Gaya, where you would not expect, you know, Gaya is in the top 10 uh, among the most polluted cities. So pollution and pollution then also feeds into health and all sorts of things. So absolutely, you know, you've got to address the the issue but you know i mean i personally like to think more uh, not so much i don't come from from the climate change angle here uh, I, I i think we can contribute to climate change but we ought to focus on uh, cleaning up the environment in our cities 
uh, because that's where the kids are getting sick and, 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 and it happens, begins from the childhood and all. So that's a very, very important part that we need to address. It's been a very tough one. I mean, you know, I was in Delhi for three years at the Niti Aayog and all. It's a big challenge. Uh, but we got to got to address it. I think there's no shortcut to it. Health, of course, you know. Then there are other issues, and, and COVID. You you mentioned public health. I think very very important. We have cut out public health. You know, we spend a lot, much more resources on medicine. But look, you know, individuals can spend, and they do. In in India, anyway, most of the medical expenditures is done by the individuals, by the families. Public expenditure on health is very limited, 1.2, 1.3 percent of GDP. You know, in education, we are doing it. I mean, in fact, this proposal in the new education policy to raise it from three to uh, from four to six percent, I would rather use that extra two percentage point and spend on public health. I think, you know, that is where you really need badly. States have neglected, you know, so very simple thing. I mean, there was a time when public health and medical used to be two separate entities and public health had its own cadre, own budget, but we merged them. I think, you know, late, uh, early fifties or late forties, you know, by mid sixties, we had merged the two and medic medical side gobbled up completely the public health side. So you have this, you know, rain comes in, standing water everywhere in the city, mosquitoes come in and you have the spread of dengue and all. And COVID is the new thing, but you know, in India, we continuously have these, uh, infections during the rainy season and all. All that needs to be addressed and public health needs to be particularly separately addressed uh, 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 and probably need to create a separate public health cadre in the states. That's for the states to do. Thank you. So, and that's, uh, that's the uh, uh, you know, right note to end this on because that's not just the uh, uh, need of the hour, but we've learned about the need of the decade as well from Dr. Fanagria over the past 45 minutes. So thank you so very much, sir, for uh, joining us and sharing your thoughts on behalf of Nudge and everyone else. My sincere pleasure to thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Kamakshi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Panagari and Kamakshi for a very rich discussion on India's development journey.